We are making good progress through the book of 1 Peter, and today will be the last section of 1 Peter chapter 4. So that's 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through to 19. Peter has said an awful lot about suffering for Jesus Christ and how we should uh, compose ourselves as we suffer for Christ. And this is the last little bit about that. 1 Peter 4 verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange things were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name, in the name Christian. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Amen. That is the word of God. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever been mocked or ridiculed because of your Christ-like obedience to God's word? You know, last Monday when Annette and I were driving back from Hastings, we decided that we would have lunch at Clairville Bakery in between Masterton and Carterton. Many of you will know the owner of that bakery and that he and his wife are Christians. You will also know that from the start, this man decided that his bakery would always be closed on Sundays. Now, I have never been there to see what reaction the general public have when they arrive at Clairville Bakery on a Sunday morning, thinking that they will enjoy a fantastic brunch, then only to see the sign on the door saying, closed on Sundays. Yes, I've never been there to see their reaction. However, it's not difficult to imagine what words of disappointment and ridicule they could utter. I mean, often in the past, when I was preaching in Masterton, and Annette and I were driving to one or other congregation members' home for lunch, the whole region of Masterton, Carterton, Greytown, Martinborough, and Featherston was a buzz with morning markets and stalls selling their wares. So the impression you get is that the vast majority of people in the Wairarapa, they don't go to church anymore. For them, Sunday has become a day of relaxation, business, and sport. 
So if people with such habits and, and such mindsets turned up at Clareville Bakery on a Sunday morning only to find the doors closed, I won't be surprised if they would raise their eyebrows in, in total amazement and ridicule and mock the owner of that bakery, saying things like, Wow, this guy must be stupid. He must be crazy. He can make lots of money on a Sunday. Sunday is the best day. They might say, how narrow-minded. How ultra-conservative. What an ancient Puritan. Indeed, I won't be surprised if that would be their reaction to that bakery owner's heartfelt decision to honor God by keeping the Sabbath set apart for worshiping God and allowing all his employees to do the same, as we have just heard this morning from Exodus 20. Well, that could be their reaction. But what would be his reaction to their reaction? I'm not sure if that bakery owner has ever in person heard the public reaction. But if he did, I could imagine that even though he loves Christ and stands by his decision to have his bakery closed on Sundays, he might perhaps feel at least some measure of sadness, knowing how his name is being belittled in public and dragged through the mud. Well, my brother and sister, I can assure you, be this bakery owner ever so much ridiculed, his hardship is nothing compared to the hardship of Christians in countries of persecution, and there are many today. And it's nothing compared to the trials of the Apostle Peter's church members. Those early Christians suffered ridicule, shaming, unemployment, and persecution because of their obedience to Christ their Lord. And it, because it's so easy for any human being to give up when you're mocked, when you're ridiculed and persecuted, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, wrote the words of our text. And here is our text's main message. Christian, are you perhaps suffering ridicule, mocking, bullying, persecution because of your faith in Christ? Don't give up. Don't lose your faith. For look, here are three ways in which you can cope with this kind of suffering. The first way is keeping persecution in perspective. Secondly, suffering for the right reason. And thirdly, entrusting your soul to God. Firstly, then, keeping persecution in perspective. Boys and girls, imagine a family who is so happy because they're going overseas to visit loved ones whom they have not seen in years. So they're all super excited. But then, very unexpectedly, and much to their surprise, their travel agent gives them this sobering news. Before you can travel, you all first need to get your vaccinations. Wow, what painful news, especially for little Johnny in that family. After all, Johnny is super scared of needles. So Johnny cries and he goes almost hysterical. He simply cannot understand why the strange thing has to happen to him. But thankfully, Johnny's older sister comes and says, Johnny, do you want to come with us to Canada to visit our cousins? Of course, Johnny says. Well, says his sister, 
then come take that injection. See, Johnny, the pain of that injection will be over in one minute. Johnny, that is nothing compared to the four weeks of holiday in Canada and the plane ride and seeing cousins Harry and Laura and Caitlin. See what Johnny's older sister did? She has put Johnny's pain for him in perspective. She has put Johnny's pain for him in the right light. And so finally, Johnny went with his family to the clinic, and he got his injection. Well, in verse 12 of our text, Peter does a similar, yet a way more weighty thing for Christians who suffer the pain of being mocked, ridiculed, and persecuted for their faith. You see, most of Peter's first readers had just come out of paganism. They had just received Christ as their Savior. And most likely, when they first received Christ, they did not realize that they could be mocked for that. And, and even that they could be persecuted. And so, the fact that people then started mocking ridiculing and persecuting them. Well, that came as a painful surprise to them, much as Johnny's injection came as a painful surprise to him. But Peter, concerned that in their trials they might give up their faith in Christ, says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you as though some strange thing were happening to you. And then, for practical purposes, Peter says the following. This ridicule, this mocking and persecution is God's way of testing and purifying you that you will be ready when judgment day comes. You see the word for fiery ordeal in verse 12 is the same as for a furnace in which gold is purified. Mocking and ridicule is God's way of purifying you and me. Perhaps someone will say, but, but pastor, if I am mocked or bullied, because I have come up for Christ, what does that have to do with, with Judgment Day? Well, you know, just as a mock exam in school is not pleasant, yet has the purpose of getting one ready for the real and final exam, so, says Peter, are your and my sufferings for Christ here on earth a blessing in disguise? Yes, a way of preparing us for that judgment day, the day of our Lord's return. Yes, God sees and allows our sufferings for Christ as testing to make our faith stronger so that we will be ready to meet the judge of heaven and earth on that last day. Boys and girls, have schoolmates ever mocked you or laughed at you because you refused to participate in a bad thing they wanted you to do? Because perhaps you are not abusing the name of God like they do? Parents, have you ever spoken up against unbiblical teaching in your child's school curriculum. And then you received a frown. Young people, brothers and sisters, at your work's end of year party, have you ever been frowned at because you didn't drink as much and you didn't stay as long as the rest? Or have your workmates ever said, Oh, come on, the boss and the IRD will not know. 
And you said, but God certainly knows. But then they ridiculed you and they shamed you. You know, I still remember when Annette and I and our family were fresh in New Zealand. And Annette's colleagues went on a teacher strike for higher wages. Annette and a handful of our kindergarten teachers said, No, we don't think it's right before God. And so we won't participate in your strike. Well, no wonder those who didn't want to participate in that strike got ostracized. Some later on got gossiped about and smartly bullied. Well, God sees our sufferings for Christ as testing to make our faith stronger so that we will be ready to meet the judge of heaven and earth on that last day. And look, It is in this light that God's discipline often starts not with the unbeliever, but with his beloved covenant people. I mean, is this not why also the Apostle Paul told the Christians in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world on the last day. And is this not why Hebrews 11 says about Moses that he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because Moses was looking ahead to his reward? See, for the joy of traveling overseas to go see his cousins, Johnny will bear the pain of the pre-flight injections. And the Christian will bear ridicule and persecution here on earth. Why? Because he or she is looking forward to that day when the ultimate judge will say, Come. You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Boys and girls, my brother and sister, will you and I be in that group? When Jesus comes and he says, come stand at my right hand. Well, look, the Christian will not just bear this mocking, this bullying, and this persecution. No, verse 13 says the Christian will even rejoice amidst this bullying. Why? Because if the Christian, if you and I are being ridiculed or persecuted for our faith in Christ, then we are actually sharing in the sufferings of Christ, as verse 13 tells us, yes, then we are ridiculed just as our Lord was ridiculed. And you know what such sharing in Christ's suffering does? Well, it ties you and me in a special bond with our Lord, who also suffered, but suffered for you and me. And you know what sharing in Christ's suffering does? It gives us joy. Just like Paul and Silas were singing hymns of joy when they were sitting in the stocks in the Philippian jail with blood oozing from their backs because they had witnessed for Christ and then got flogged. Rejoicing in sharing in Christ's sufferings. See why also Romans 8 says, if we have shared in Christ's sufferings, we will also share in his glory. My brother and sister, the Christian who suffers ridicule or persecution because of his love for Christ, such Christian can rejoice for two reasons. Firstly, because this kind of suffering prepares him or her for standing at 
at the right hand side of Christ when he comes on judgment day. And secondly, because this kind of suffering gives him or her the opportunity to bond with Christ by sharing in Christ's sufferings. Can you now see why verse 14 says that if you and I are reviled, if we are ridiculed, bullied, and persecuted for the name of Christ, we are blessed. Can you see why even Christ himself told his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 14 of our text says, Blessed are you because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. My brother and sister, I'm sure none of us likes it when we are bullied, ridiculed, and mocked. None of us will like the hardship and pain of persecution. Yet, if or when it comes to it that you and I get ridiculed, bullied, persecuted for our faith, and we find it hard to cope, then let us remember this very long point one of the sermon that we should keep persecution in perspective. What else should we remember when we suffer for Christ? Well, this brings us to a smaller yet important point number two, which is a condition. A condition when we are reviled for Christ. And that is, suffering must be for the right reason. My brother and sister, as verse 16 indicates, no one who takes a stand for Christ in this world will become a shameful thing in the eyes of unbelievers. The world will think little of the Christian who in the face of opposition does what is God-honoring. The one who takes a stand for Christ in this world will become a shameful thing in the eyes of the world. Now, if that's you, says Peter in verse 16, then do not be ashamed, but rather praise God that you bear the name Christian. But, says Peter, you see, there is a condition as to the reason for your suffering. And verse 15 gives that condition. But make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief, an evildoer, or a trouble, troublesome meddler. In other words, as one who busies himself in the affairs of others in an unwarranted manner. In other words, in verse 15, Peter is repeating what he has said many times before in this letter. And that is, that even under extreme circumstances, Christians should live immaculate lives. Why? Well, so that they will not drag the name of Christ their Lord through the mud. Peter has once said the same for wives of unbelieving husbands. Submit to your husband, even though you know it's tough. But that way you might win and you might honor the name of Christ. Sadly, that's not what a notorious Pentecostal leader and his wife did two weeks ago when on Saturday night our Prime Minister announced a snap lockdown for the Auckland region. You see, late that Saturday night, as soon as this couple heard that Auckland would be in lockdown from 6 a.m. the following morning, these two church leaders left Auckland and went to Rotorua, where the next morning in church, they boasted with great arrogance how they escaped Auckland. Of course, the behavior of this couple did not go down well with government and the New Zealand public at large, especially because of government's concern, which government already had 
or the concern which had already been mounted over some churches that were and are defying lockdown rules and spreading misinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this Christian couple were not acting like good ambassadors for Christ. But as if that was not enough, then in that same Sunday morning worship in Rotorua, the same church leader's wife preached a gospel which was no gospel at all, the so-called prosperity gospel, when she exhorted the congregation not to just tithe, but to give more than tithing. For if they give more than tithing, God would bless them more with material things. And then she boasted how God had given her and her husband not an ordinary car, no, even a Tesla. A Tesla car. In other words, a car that few of the tithers in that church could afford. How shameful. And what damage to the name of Christ. And if that couple is suffering because of that, then they suffer for the wrong reason. And how in contrast with what verse 16 says, is their behavior about true Christians who truly suffer for Christ. That such Christians do not have to be ashamed for what they are suffering, but that they can praise God, that they bear the name Christian. The Apostle Paul, the Christian says, I beat my body and make it my slave. In other words, I do my utmost that I who have preached to others, that I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Well, here is the last small point as to how to cope with suffering for Christ. And that is entrusting. Yes, Peter says in verse 19, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Entrust. How can one illustrate this entrusting, this committing your soul into Christ's care? I've written quite a lot about that, and I had to put some in my footnote because the sermon would have been too long. But I think I once told the story of a man called Charles Blondin, or in French, Charles Blondin, who in the 1850s became the first tightrope walker to walk across the Niagara Falls. On this tightrope, Blondin even pushed a stove in a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls. Many spectators saw him doing that. So we can say that all this, these spectators had a head knowledge and they had intellectual assent that Blondin can indeed carry a heavy load safely across the falls. But what about their hearts, their inner conviction? What about their reliance? Well, the answer to this question came when Blondin woke, I walked up to one of the spectators and said to him, Now, sir, you have seen me push a stove across the falls. Come, let me push you now across. How did the spectator answer? He ran away screaming, No way, no way. See, see the difference between intellectual assent and entrusting? My brother and sister, it is similar to the difference between knowing with your head that Jesus is the Savior, like the devils can do, versus you entrusting your whole life and all your circumstances to him, knowing that you are in his hands and that nothing will happen outside his will. See why 
Hebrews 11 verse 1 says about faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. My brother and sister and boys and girls, do you and I have such a faith? Really entrusting our hearts and lives to God. Blessed are you if you do. We want to recap as we finish. How will the Christian, how will you and I cope with suffering for the Lord? Only firstly, by keeping persecution, our hardship in perspective, in the light of judgment day and God's blessings. Secondly, by suffering for the right reason, not because we did an evil thing. And lastly, by entrusting our soul to our faithful Creator and Savior. Amen.